since 2003. This is the Sports Source. East Tennessee's number one sports talk show. Presented by Hype Wrench and by Junk Be Gone and by the Garza Law Firm. With your host, John Pennington. The Sports Source starts now. Good Sunday morning and welcome into the Sports Source here in the Junk Be Gone studio. Happy to have you with us. Tennessee, what a week for Vol basketball. What a run they've been on, actually. They keep winning. Uh, in midweek, you've got Dalton Connect, who carries them home against Auburn. Then last night, he gets into foul trouble, doesn't have one of his best nights. Zakai Ziegler and the team carry him home. Uh, big win in Tuscaloosa yesterday. The SEC title is within grasp. Win one game, you're guaranteed a share of it. Win two games this week, you're guaranteed that you own the title by your lonesome. We'll talk about Vol basketball. Plenty of it. Dalton connects place in UT history. We'll talk about some past legends who he compares to. We'll also talk football. We'll talk a little bit of a little bit of NCAA stuff. Not much news there. We've got to mention it. We'll just get out of the way. Talk about football. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. Let's get right into it. First segment of today's show brought to you by Junk Be Gone. Call them for dumpster rentals. I do it every year. Or for demolition of sheds, barns, porches, even mobile homes, any kind of small demolition job, or I would consider those medium demolition jobs, they can handle that for you. Or call them for a two-man uniform team to come load up and haul away large items from inside your home. They do it all. Junk Be Gone, there's nobody better. Tell them we sent you junkbegone.biz to learn more. All right, let's welcome in the uh, first wave of panelists. We have a few more guys waiting in the wings right over here. Excellent hosting, hosting <laughs> last week. Josh Ward, thanks for being here. Thanks, Sean. And thanks for last week. Ryan Callahan, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Former D1 basketball player, former UT assistant coach Mark Pankratz. By the way, I thought Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where you played, changed their name to just Milwaukee like so many teams did. And I was looking yesterday, and they were listed as Wisconsin-Milwaukee again. Yeah. Which is it? Is it Wisconsin-Milwaukee or just Milwaukee? Just more. It doesn't matter. We beat Green Bay last there night. You go. <laughs> that's, that's all that matters. And right down there, Chuck Cavalier is back with us as always. Chuck, thanks for being here. Okay, six straight wins for the Volunteers, eight of their last nine. Midweek win over Bruce Pearl and Auburn. Then they held a great Alabama offense to just 74 points last night. Matter of fact, a uh, friend of mine who – is into the numbers. Send me this note. Alabama was 3 of 18 on field goals in the last 14 minutes. Uh, they missed their last 14 three-point shots on the night. So is that them cold? Is that good Tennessee defense? Probably a little bit of both. I can't remember a Tennessee team that can beat you one night with its offense, can beat you the next night yeah. with its defense, and then when, when they need it, they can just have a superstar who can carry them. I've never seen – I don't know what it means for the tournament, but I've never seen a Tennessee team in the last 20, 30 years that could beat you in as many different ways with regularity as this team. So let's talk about the big takeaway specifically from last night and the victory at Tuscaloosa. Mark Pankratz, start us off. Well, you look at – going into the season, you look at, all right, which games you're going to win, maybe could, which ones you're going to lose. I, I chalked that one up at the beginning of the year. I thought that was going to be a loss. Not to mention you whoop them here, yes. what's on the line. You had a really high-energy, emotional game versus Auburn that you win. Um, that's a big-time win. That, that's a culture win. We're going to talk about the offense and defense, and that deserves all the credit. But at the end of the day, that game was about toughness. That game was about 50-50 balls, leadership of, of players on the floor. They talked about You could see there was big moments where after that, that Meshack hits that shot in the corner, run back, sprint, gets the steal. Exactly. That's the and one. They're all going nuts. And what's Zakai doing? Telling them to calm down. Game's not over. <laughs> we got to keep playing. Like that little stuff, yes, all the talent. But that's the differentiation of this team compared to other talented teams in the country and why, deservingly so, they're getting talks about being able to make that Final Four run. Yeah, and that might be a number one seed kind of game right. as well. Didn't Vescovi even draw up a play in the huddle mm -hmm. at one point? You know, they were talking about that. You mentioned Mayshack. What I liked was Tennessee was ready to play from the get-go. Some of these games on the road, they haven't gotten off to a good start. Well, they were there to play. They overcome that slow, that slow spell at the end of the first half. They've got so many different guys that can make plays. I mean, a, a dude plays four minutes in the first half, and he gets 10 of his 12 in the second half. The veteran players is what stood out to me. Those are the guys that really came up with basketball game-winning plays, even if they didn't score big. 
What's that to you guys? I think this game, as much as any, showed why Tennessee's going to be a tough out in March because, again, they can win so many different ways. You know, for, for Dalton Connect to have such, a, such an off night by his standards, <clears throat> did yeah. the same thing at Kentucky. They managed to win both those games on the road despite him not having a typical game that, that we're used to seeing from him lately. Um, it, again, Jonas Adu in foul trouble early, bounces back in the second half to play well. I mean, Josiah Jordan James hitting some big shots. Uh, Jemiah Meshack obviously hitting some big shots, making big plays on defense. They, they can beat you so many ways. Jordan Ganey had a nice first half. I mean, so many guys that can beat you in so many different ways. I, I, I can't think of a, a former Tennessee, a past Tennessee team that had that kind of makeup, and I can't think of many teams across the country that are that versatile, that dangerous on one night. You know, any given night, they can beat you five or six different ways. Josh? Yeah, mental and physical toughness. I mean, they were prepared going in that Josiah might have to play the five because they, they knew that foul trouble could be coming for the big men. It happened. They were ready. He had 13 rebounds in the game. Coming back against Auburn at home, okay, you could kind of see that that could happen. Yeah. Come back at home. They surrender the lead from the first half on the road against a really good Alabama team. They're down in the middle of the second half, and they have the mental toughness to know we got to step up, we have to make plays, this is what we have to do. And different guys did it. Starters, guys off the bench. Meshack was huge. He plays winning basketball. And that Bama crowd was into it, too. Yeah. I mean, that was one. You know how I feel about road games. Since 2022, SEC teams win 78% of their home games. So you got a one-in-five shot going on the road. To go into that environment, and one thing we've talked about, this team, they, they get a lot of fouls called on them, yep. and they don't get fouls called on their opponents. So you're going to be f- fighting from behind in terms of foul territory a lot in the tournament, you would think. They did that last night on the road, harsh environment, and still win the game. But to me, you've got two players in Zakai and Connect that attract multiple defenders numerous times, and they make the right read. I do think going into the, the future, if I'm playing Tennessee, I do what Auburn tried to do and not help off of Zakai's penetration. Make Zakai finish over the top of you, he struggles in that. When the defense kicks or the defense sinks, they're kicking it and spraying the ball around and we're getting good looks. Connect, the reason why he's a really good player in Zakai is because when they force that double team, they've got the X's and O's, the mental uh, awareness to make the right read. Connect did that multiple times, and guys were knocking down shots. And then we get the ball inside. Adu and Tobey, they create great angles that forces that defense down there and then, again, gets, gets open looks for each other. We'll talk about Connect. We've got a whole segment dedicated to Dalton Connect uh, coming up. But I want to throw one blurb out here. Uh, when you talk about a player like that who was one of the top guys in the transfer portal and he wants to come here to learn his defense and to improve defensively, his offense has gotten better in terms of numbers. Now, he's no longer at Northern Colorado. You could say he's got more weapons around him, and that, that changes. Yeah. They can't, somebody just can't focus on him. But I've thrown as many barbs at Rick Barnes as anyone in terms of that offense. Kudos to Rick Barnes. See, how we wondered going into the year, is he going to stifle this guy? If he doesn't play great defense, is he going to lift him? He's let him do his thing, and he's actually gotten better offensively it, than he was last I year. I mean, look at, look at Meshack. Meshack was just a straight athlete when he got here that could really defend. He's knocking down jump shots pretty consistently at this point of the year. He, he's continuing to get better. Jonas Adu. I mean, you can go up and down the line. If I'm looking at this program as a place to transfer, all the way back to Kevin Punter, he's got proof in getting guys better offensively and, prepara- and prepared for the next level. Yeah, and look, Alabama was, set, what, second in the country, averaging 91 and a half points a game. And you go into their building and you hold them to, what, 74? And, John, I had it down the stretch one of 17 at crunch time, and then they finally score with like a minute 14 to go on the Mark Sears layup. But they couldn't get anything going and missing all those threes. You got to give Tennessee credit because they're they're veteran guys. The play Meshack made. He could have postured after hitting a three at the buzzer right in the corner. He hustles back down court, gets a steal, flips it back in. They get a three point play. That's a six point swing in about eight seconds. Anything else? Uh, just the mental toughness. I mean, I, yeah. I, they did, Alabama didn't hit many shots down the stretch, but every time they did, it seemed like Tennessee went right back down the court and scored. Bama made their runs. Tennessee bounced right back. That's that's not something you see out of a non-veteran team often. And so Tennessee's veterans showed up in a big way. Yeah. yeah, and Mark, I think you said culture win. I mean, they're a few days removed from an all-time performance by Dalton Connect. Well, he, he wasn't able to do that on the road, but he still hit a, a shot late that they needed. Yeah. And other guys stepped up and did things, just knowing that, well, we're not getting 39 from Dalton tonight. That's not going to yeah. happen every night. That's been a question. Can they get it done if they don't have big offensive play from 
Dalton Connect, they did it on the road against a quality tournament team. Yeah, and I mean, last he only gave them 13 points. Right. Only 13, which yeah. for the most part, with the exception of the Kevin Punter year under Rick Barnes, your leading scorer's been somebody who's averaged 14 or 15 points. And we're talking about, well, it was a down night. He only got 13. <laughs> um, one thing I will say this. I was talking earlier, and you, you kind of agreed with this, the fact that I can't remember a Tennessee team that is this – versatile that can beat you in so many ways and I'm sure there are people going to be out there saying well this team only lost five games well this team only lost four games remember Rick Barnes plays the toughest schedule in the country too I mean if this team had decided to play the schedule that Auburn played this year their record's better you know you chose to say all right we're going to a tournament where we're going to play Kansas and we're going to play Purdue oh and then we're going to go on the road to North Carolina you took on some of those big games and that, that reflects in the loss column I think if, you, if this were an IROC series and you just put them up against any Vol team, I, I don't know many that I would pick to beat this Tennessee team from all the past UT teams I've seen. Yep. All right. Uh, let's talk about what's coming up in today's show. We have takeaways from the Vol victory. Well, we've, we've got that knocked out for the most part. Connect and Vol <laughs> Legends, that's next. Uh, UT's lineups, the good and the bad. By the numbers, we'll look at the top five lineups that Rick Barnes likes to use, which are the strongest, which aren't. Bracketology and scouting reports. NCAA pauses its investigation into NIL. We'll talk about that. 14-team playoff news this week. Some new stuff came out there. Is the SEC looking to exit the NCAA? An interesting story that kind of got buried. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, we've got to have a Cavaliers line for Tennessee's game at South Carolina. All that coming up. When we come back, though, let's talk about Dalton Connect and the type of season he is having compared to some past UT legends. And if you're sitting there saying, well, they did this in the game last night. Yeah, after I'd spent <laughs> hours researching it. So you're going to see a better graphic telling you the same information next. Heck with ESPN. Come on back. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by AG Heinz Company. If you're going to start a do-it-yourself project or a large-scale building job, keep telling you folks, start with A.G. Hines Company. Uh, and I'm not the only one who believes that. A.G. Hines Company was recently awarded Supplier of the Year by the Associated General Contractors. Find out why. Get down to A.G. Hines Company. They're right in downtown Knoxville. Do a tremendous job. Just think of it this way. Any project you're starting, it should start at A.G. Hines Company. AGHines.com to learn more. All right. Here's a guy who does a lot of home improvement projects. You can barely That's move right. today because you were doing something yesterday. <laughs> exactly. Bob Hodge. Don't ask me to turn and look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, Bob. Uh, we all know what Dalton Connect did versus Auburn. It was unbelievable the other night. And I told you that I'm going to do a special segment on this. And because I'm doing the yep. special segment, it's like the one we did on minutes. Then when they blew somebody out and they played everybody their minutes, I said he will have a low night for him, which he did. That's college basketball. But still – I wanted to look at the kind of season he is having. So take a look at these numbers. First of all, since 1993-94, 30 years, here are the players who've averaged at least 20 points a game at Tennessee. There are four. In 30 years, you've only had four guys who've averaged 20 points a game, which is pretty amazing. Dalton Connect on that list, along with Kevin Punter, Chris Lofton did it for a year, and Ron Slay did it way back 20 years ago. But look at this number, and this is the one ESPN stole, but mine looks better. <laughs> mine looks far better. Oh, that's a far better graphic. Yeah, it's job. a far better graphic. 35 <laughs> points. I wanted to see if 35 was the, the best place for a break. At 30, you get a ton of them, and he's had six 30-point games. But I wanted to see how many guys have had a 35-point or more game, uh, how many times in a season. And what I found was, and apparently what ESPN also found, Dalton Connect has had four of those this year. Tony White had four of those in 86-87. Ernie Grunfeld had five of those type games in 75-76. Bernard King did it twice. He had four of those games in 74-75 and four more in 75-76. Uh, I mean, you're going back 50 years to see what Dalton Connect is, well, who he's in, in cahoots with here. You're talking about three of the most explosive players in Tennessee basketball history, and Connect's already there, and there's still time in this season to go, you're, Bob. You're, you're talking about the two all-time greats, I think, people in Ernie Grunfeld and Bernard King. And unfortunately for Dalton Connect, I'm sure he cares about what I think, I haven't given him the credit. You saw what he did against Auburn, and then last night he goes quiet. He hasn't had that many quiet games. I think he may suffer just a little bit in, in fans' perspective from being on such a good basketball team because he kind of that, – that's a very talented team, and so you're sitting there. Now, what he did against Auburn 
the other night was almost superhuman for him to take over that game at the end. Yeah. But I think throughout the course of the season, he's on a very good team. He's a great player. And I don't think I've had him up in that status when you and I talked about that graphic you just showed yesterday. Yeah. Kind of blew me away. And we talked about it two days ago. Yes, you, exactly. Thank you very much. So, I mean, no, that, <laughs> that, was, that was coming long before ESPN <laughs> put it up. Yeah. Uh, let me, I, go ahead. I, I think the, his greatness and a lot of those guys' greatness is, is beyond the stat sheet. I mean, you look at last night, or even Auburn, right? They go out, Auburn switches broom onto him, he knocks down a three. Next time he drives it, next time they run two people at it, he makes the right pass that leads to an assist. Last night, he drives, hits the pull-up jump shot. Next time down, he makes the right pass, and it's the hockey assist where it was the right pass to then the next person. And so he is making all of his teammates better, and that's what a great player is. When, it, when it's not your night, you're not making shots, or there's a defensive scheme that's kind of giving you a little trouble. Like last night, one of the best defensive schemes against Connect is, is to make him cover. Teams are trying to wear him down by attacking him on defense, and, and so now he's still making the right read. And that's what makes him a special player. I've seen guys that can score the basketball, and if they're hitting, they're hitting. But it may take 25 shots to get there. Right, right. And the next night they have 13 yeah. points, but they still shot their 25 shots. Yeah. Connect's not like that. He's, he's playing in his, in his space and his rhythm. I agree with all that. I just can't put that on a graphic. <laughs> so when you're trying to make it easy and show people what you kind know, of score this guy is, that's and, what and you get. But like, you're correct. There is more to him just than just Just like with score. Albert, your game plan is going to be, we're not going to let Dalton Connect beat us. If we got to double team him, whatever we got to do, he was averaging what twenty six points a game in the SEC in the SEC play. They hold him to thirteen. Here was what I liked that they showed late when Dalton Connect was on the floor. Tennessee was plus fourteen scoring, outscoring uh, Alabama. When he was on the bench, they're minus twelve. Yeah, that goes to Late your point. When he's on the floor, you're up fourteen. When he's on the bench, you're down twelve. Uh, SEC Player of the Year. Yes. Yes. Is that a lock at this point? I, I think, think it is. With yes. how he's done head to head, Mark Sears was up there. I mean, how he's done head to head and how he continues to get it done. Well, I think I think Albert might have put him over the top. I mean, three games to go, but the performance there at the end, I think that might. Have I just him. wonder if people were looking last night thinking Alabama's the game where he can put it away, and he had a thirteen point effort, which by I, his did, I think if they good. get a share of the SEC title, there's not a. It, it'll be him. All right, now there's talk about he could be in the running for national player of the year. I don't see how he, he passes Edie at Purdue. Yeah. He's number two in the nation in scoring. He's number three in rebounding, or vice versa. Look, if if, ten, if Connect had those numbers, Tennessee fans would be saying, "Well, don't look at the numbers." Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't think he's going to get national player of the year, but. He's certainly going to be in the mix. First team All American. Yeah, exactly. There's what no I was question, thinking. is there? Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, I did want to say th- one thing when I was looking at those graphics, and Bob and I were talking about Dalton Connect the other day, and we were talking about what level of explosive scorer he is. And I told Bob, I said, look, Chris Lofton is a great shooter. Allen Houston, hell of a player. But in my head, Dalton Connect's the most explosive player I've seen at Tennessee since Tony White. So put these numbers together, and I was a little bit surprised to see that, yes, Tony White, it's Grunfeld, King, White. And let me put up some information here on Tony White. And I know there is a push right now by a friend of Tony White to get Tony White's jersey retired. I happen to agree with it. He's number three on Tennessee's all-time scoring list. He scored more points than Dale Ellis, Bernard King, or Chris Lofton. Two of the three highest scoring games in UT history, the highest at 51 points, and he also scored 49 in a game. He's on Tennessee's all-century team. He was on the SEC all-freshman team. He made the all-SEC team twice. He was SEC player of the year in 86-87. He was only a third-team All-American, though. That doesn't fit the criteria. He's already in the Tennessee State Sports Hall of Fame, uh, and we got video of that 51-point effort uh, on Valentine's in 1987. Uh, Bob, Chuck, you guys saw him play. Uh, it's, it's, I, I understand you got to have rules, but there's also a time when you, somebody doesn't fit all the into the square box, well, you, and he's one of the guys. If you've got rules, and here you are almost 40 years down the line, and yet you may have had one or two guys even in his orbit, not as good as him, but in the orbit, okay, take your rules and throw them out and say, look, we've got an all-timer for 40 years. And so, to me, that ought to be, how does he stand against guys now? And as me and you were talking about it, you pointed out, he had the three-point shot for 
Two yeah, years? Yeah, one year. One year. When he became official his last year. He only had and, 68 attempts his yeah, career. And, and so he did all that without the benefit, which takes away n- nothing from the guys who have it now because it's a different game. No, I mean, he's the wizard. <laughs> I mean, he did things – you hardly see anybody else do on just about any level. And, when uh, you know, if you stood next to Tony White, you wouldn't have thought he was a great basketball player. I mean, he's like 6'1", he's not that big, but he does remarkable things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd give him any accolade you could. Okay, so that's three people that say retire it, Mark Pankratz. Well, I think there has to be a rules or, or, or criteria, criteria to, to make somebody qualify because – if there's an emotional tie, like a fan favorite type of thing, then you start can diluting who gets to hang up there. Based off of that, the criteria, if they adjust the criteria, I mean, he's one of the best of all time. Maybe it should be, um, he, his jersey should be raised. I just think you do have to have a criteria. Maybe the criteria is not right currently. It's not currently set up the right way. Um, but I do think you have to have that criteria. Yeah, so in, in, you're not being anti-Tony White, but in your opinion, you've got the, you've got the rules. If he doesn't fit the rules – you don't hang the jersey. Well, is the rule yeah. third team All American? Is that it's what? your first team? I think first team All American. Well, right? then, then so, to me, if you don't check one box and you check twelve, <laughs> hang it up. Or. You know, and one thing that may keep fans from really jumping on the bandwagon is think about it. He was not on television that much. Nowadays, yeah. we've seen every game almost that Dalton Connect has played. Yeah. Tony White might have been on TV during his his last season tournaments four times, yeah. five times. Yeah. You know, and so maybe that just doesn't Dang, stick. y'all are old, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice knowing you, Mark. Yeah. But at least we don't wear the Nate Oates jacket, man. Right. Uh, when we come back, uh, let's take a look at Tennessee's five lineups that Rick Barnes has used the most often in the last five games. Which are better? Where are they stronger? Uh, are there any lineups we would use? What stands out to us, if anything? Interesting dive inside the numbers here. Lineups for lineups as we go into turn up to time that you can – Kind of file away and know when these guys come on the court what you're going to get from them. Coming back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Parkside Cabin Rentals. Fully equipped kitchens, private hot tubs, incredible views, game rooms. All those things are available from Parkside Cabin Rentals. And you can pick your location, getting as close to Gatlinburg as you like, and always getting free parking. When you go into town in Gatlinburg, visit ParksideCabinRentals.com today to set up your big vacation plans for the spring, for the summer, or heck, for football season if you're planning way out ahead. Parkside Cabin Rentals. All right, let's take a look. we got a poll. Well, let me introduce Vince Ferrara, first of all. Vince, you had trouble getting in here today. I appreciate (laughs) you making it. I appreciate you having me. All right, and now let's do the poll question, and we're going to get you involved in what we brought up in the last segment. And the poll question is, should Tennessee retire Tony White's jersey? Your choices are, no, he's not good enough. And right now, that's about 9% of you. Uh, Some would say, we have criteria. That's the Mark Pankratz (laughs) choice. That's 19% of you. And then the other choice is, retire it already. That's 72% of you. You let us know whether, hey, look, man, rules are rules. we got criteria. You live by them. Or you think he should go in there. Or if you watched him play and just think, nope, not good enough. You tell us. It's your call. And uh, I'm sure Danny White will be taking notes. All right. Uh, let's take a look very closely. Only two regular seasons remain. Only two regular season games remain. Most common lineups. These are the previous five games, uh, not counting last night. But these are the lineups Tennessee has used most often. And we're going to explain this to you. You don't have to sit there and get up close to your TV. Basically, you see each of their lineups and the percentage of minutes they've been playing. So that top ones, that's your starters. That's 25% of the time they've been in there. Their offensive rating, according to CBB Analytics, 97th percentile. So there's only 3% of the teams in the country are even better offensively than that lineup. Only 4% are better defensively, so they're top 96th percentile. The red numbers, offensive rebounding, defensive rebounding, free throw attempt rate, those are where they struggle. Okay, this is on the season. So these are, these are the top lineups the last five games, but it's their numbers together over the course of the entire season when they're on the floor together. So when you take the starters out and you bring in Ganey for Vescovy, Awaka for Adu, this is the second most used lineup recently. It's a, kind of a pretty big drop there. Um, down to 79% offensive rating, 74th percentile defensive rating. The free throws go down, the free throw attempts go down. They turn the ball over more. They don't get as many block shots. Um, it's better with the other. Now, you're, you're playing 
uh, you're trying to get a walk on the floor to get A do a break. But that next block down, the next lineup, Ziegler, Ganey, Connect, James, and Adu is better than the Ziegler, Ganey, Connect, James, and Awaka lineup. And then on down the line, the only one you see a real drop-off is, interestingly enough, Ziegler, Ganey, Connect, Awaka, and Adu at the same time, and that's one of the reasons they beat Missouri a couple of weeks ago. But defensive rating, when those guys have been on the floor together, 35th percentile. That really drops defensively. Two-point percentage is terrible. Pace of play slows down. Defensive rebounds bad. Steal percentage down. Anything you see here that stands out in terms of these lineups? Vince? Well, that's surprising that the, the numbers drop off that much with the Waka and Adu on the floor together. I mean, I know what you're trying to accomplish is the rebounding first mm -hmm. and foremost, but uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised that they give up so much in some of those other areas. I think it comes down to ball screen defense. With those two guys on the floor, uh, it puts a Walker or Adu in a challenging spot where they're, where they're not as comfortable. Um, you know, the other thing that, that sticks out to me, it's the importance of the three guys that we've talked about all year. You, most of these guys with Ziggler, Connect, and Adu. I mean, those are your three guys. Yep. You can mix and match. Now, I do think you're moving forward. Barnes talked about after the Texas A&M game, one of the adjustments he made is we got to get Mayshack some more minutes because when teams have spread us out and not being able to, uh, to guard penetration, we've struggled at times. So Mayshack is, is better at that. I think you'll see more of him here down the stretch. Well, and you really only have the five lineups you've played most recently, you really only see Mayshack on the floor when it's Ziegler, Ganey, Mayshack, Connect, Awaka. Um, the uh, one thing that stood out to me, Josh, that I thought was kind of interesting, Vescovy, starter. Vescovy, 25% of the, the playing time with that starting lineup. But Z Vescovy's not a guy he uses with the mix and match lineups. He's not in any of those next four lineups which surprised me a little bit, that there wasn't one other group that he's in there with that gets a ton of playing time. Yeah, that is kind of interesting considering his experience, his understanding what they're doing on both ends of the floor. Now, when we see, first of all, they've got the right starting five. I'm not sure that anybody yeah. was questioning that, but they've, they've knocked on what everybody will say. They've stayed healthy, and that group together has so much experience together. But I have to imagine when we see the, the next lineup, uh, Adu to Awaka. Awaka is a very capable backup, but Adu, what he's able to do uh, on both ends of the floor, how he's able to help uh, in the pick and roll game, different spots where he can be offensively around the yeah. basket and stretch <clears throat> things out. That has to be why I think their offensive rating is so much better because what he's able to do with Zakai and Dalton with the basketball mm. uh, can be a killer against the other team. I also think those two lineups that maybe are towards the bottom in the scoring – don't have Josiah Jordan James. And I think that highlights something that Mark talks about all the time, and that's the value of Josiah Jordan James beyond just what the numbers show on the stat line and the box score. Anything else? Uh, the, the other piece, uh, you'll never have Zakai and Connect out at the same time. Uh, and so I think yeah. that Vescovy, that's another reason why you don't see Vescovy in some of these other ones. Very good. All right. Uh, when we come back, Bracketology, SEC standings, and the scouting report for Tennessee versus South Carolina, Tennessee versus Kentucky. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Southeast Termite and Pest Control. The weather is starting to warm up, and that means it's time to start thinking about spring, as in crawl space encapsulations to protect your home from excess humidity and moisture. And, of course, spring means mosquitoes, termites, carpenter bees, Lots of stuff. I'll be back around. Southeast Termite and Pest Control can help with one or all of those. Southeast Termite and Pest Control, southeasttermite.com to learn more. All right, let's take a look at the latest bracketology report. According to Joe Lenardi, he has them in the South region, which ends in Dallas. He's got them starting in Charlotte. He has them as a two seed against Fairfield in the first round and then playing the winner of Texas Tech, Nevada. Jerry Palm of CBS has Tennessee still in the Midwest Regional going to Detroit. He's got them starting in Memphis. Number two seed going against Moorhead State in the first round and then playing the winner of TCU versus Virginia. Uh, then if you take a look at the SEC standings, here you go, Tennessee in first place. Uh, you've got Alabama and South Carolina second, then Auburn and Kentucky down there. You, the simple way to look at it is this. If Tennessee beats South Carolina, they get a share of the title, period. If Tennessee beats South Carolina and Kentucky, they win the whole thing outright. If they split this week, but Alabama loses this week at least once, you're going to win the title too. So you got to win at least one to get some share of the title. I think they only have one outright title, which you guys won, since the 60s. So to get an outright title is great, but they've already 
knock on wood, if they win one of the games this week, they're already going to get a share of the title either way. Uh, so let me just start with you. They've got South Carolina. They've got Kentucky. Scouting reports first. Uh, rematches in both cases. Carolina came in here and beat them on their home court. Now you're going over there. Uh, Kentucky, you went up there and beat them on their home court. Now they're coming here. What do you expect in the rematches, Mark Pankratz? Well, when we played South Carolina, they did a great job of dictating tempo. Uh, we only got 56 shots that game. Last night, we had about 60, so almost 10 shots more. Uh, and we had a lot more free throw attempts last night uh, than when South Carolina. So they dictated tempo. They were tough. They spread us out. We did not do a good job of um, guarding the basketball, you know, guarding your yard, not letting guys attack penetration. They shot it better uh, in that first half, South Carolina did, than they normally did. Um, and I think we overcorrected. We started to help too much on penetration um, and, and just got us out of whack. So I expect them to try to dictate tempo again, slow us down. You saw it last night with Alabama. Every time that ball went up, whether they scored or not, their, their coaching staff was screaming, get yeah. back, get back, because Rick Barnes, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy to think, Rick Barnes is telling these guys, go, 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 go. So I think South Carolina slowed down. Then the flip side, you go to Kentucky, who, played, who scored 111 points yesterday. They want to dictate tempo. And as a coach, you always talk about every game has its own own chess match, its own puzzle pieces. And that's why this team is so good. Their veteran leadership allows them to adapt and still be really good. Most teams, like Kentucky, they're going to they're gonna try to outscore you. They can't defend. If they can outscore you, they're going to win. Tennessee, on the flip side, against Kentucky, we've got to do a better job of dictating tempo. we got to make the, the game muddy and ugly in the half court and be able to score in the half court and keep Kentucky from getting going up and down because if that's when they can stay in the game with their offensive firepower. Which game concerns you more, Carolina on the road, Kentucky here? Carolina on the road, actually. Uh, I think Carolina's coming down to reality a little bit. Uh, they've had a great season. He'll probably get coach of the year in Coach yeah. Paris. Um, but I think if you – now, I thought this last year when it was Lofton's jersey retirement, I was like, man, there is no way Tennessee's going to lose to Kentucky in that environment. I say the same thing. Um, if we can, if we can go a, in to win the SEC championship, you got to think you'd win. But Alabama was thinking that last night too. That's right. What happens this week? One and one, two and zero. Oh? I'm, I'm not giving say, you over. I've been saying since last week. I said we'd go three and one. Uh, I thought we'd lose. I actually thought we'd lose that one. But I'm going to stick to it. I think. And look, fans, if we lose one, it's okay. It's not the end <laughs> of the world. Like it may actually bring us back to reality a little bit before you go on this NCA run. Um, so if we lose one, it's not the end of the world. I think we'll go one and one. I think that's a good point. I I never like going into the tournament I mean, on some big you long win, win if streak. You win, think about it, if you win both these games, you could go in as the number one team in the country. You could be ranked number one in the country if you win these two teams mm. against ranked opponents. No one else has this yeah. schedule. You go four and zero, you could be number one. A lot of pressure. And if you're wanting a number one seed, you got to be pulling against Arizona right now because that's the one that could falter. I yep. think the other three seem to be locked in, but I think Arizona could drop. And then what is North Carolina doing? Because you're kind of neck and neck with them, and they have the head to head with you in yep. Chapel Hill. Mark Pankratz, thanks again. Exactly. Uh, you're, you're good luck. You've, you're holding your voice together. I know it's tournament time. You got three girls teams you're coaching. So we have, good luck to you. We have four more games. I got to make it through today. All right, very good. When we come back, the NCAA has paused its NIL investigations. So is it back to business as usual at Tennessee? Come on back and we'll discuss. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Madisonville Marine. The downtown Knoxville boat show ends today. That means you've got to get to the convention center today to check out 30 boats from Madisonville Marine alone, including their newest line of boats, Cravalli. Incredible rebates and deals at the downtown Knoxville Boat Show. Stop by, see Joe Special and his team at the Madisonville Marine booth today. Madmarine.com to learn more about this great place. All right, uh, back with Josh, Vince, and Ryan. Let's go ahead and remind you of our poll question for today, and that is, should Tennessee retire Tony White's jersey? We've got the options are, nope, he wasn't good enough, or B, uh, we've got criteria for a reason, or C, Yes, retire it already. That's your question. So use the QR code with your phone or go to sportsource.tv forward slash polls. Let us know your answer. You are, you know, Danny White and the UT administrators, they're sitting there right now. They're, they're taking notes on this. They, <laughs> nobody watches that poll more than they do, I'm sure. So you're telling everybody in town uh, your voice on this. All right. Uh, a week ago, Judge Clifton Corker granted the state of Tennessee the injunction it was looking for in the NCAA NIL case. 
Uh, that put everything on ice, at least until the actual court case. The NCAA, as a result this week, sent out a letter to all its schools saying that the Division I Board of Directors had told enforcement staff to, quote, pause and not begin investigations involving third-party participation in NIL-related activities. There will be no penalty for conduct that occurs consistent with the injunction with the injunction in place. Okay, that seems to suggest that they're not giving up. They're not throwing in the towel. They're, we're going through with this. And if we win the case somehow, some way, which they won't, uh, if we do, then we'll come back and penalties will be a big deal again. As of today, Vince, is it business as usual? Back to normal for Tennessee? I think so. I, I don't, and everyone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see a pathway for the NCA to, one, win, two, come back and be able to enforce uh, I, I do think it goes back to the way they have been operated, and it, it didn't really change, and, and I think that that's definitely their direction. I, I think their statement had to be worded in a way that says, we don't really like this, we're begrudgingly going along with this, but we've got to move forward and not really focus our time and energy on this. And I don't, yeah, I don't think they're going to circle back to it. I, there was no threat of retroactive punishments for anyone who does something in the meantime. Yeah. Um, so I, I think they're showing... In a, in a begrudging way that they're moving forward only because some other people, so a lot of schools, remember, wanted them to fight this, so they did. They let them know, hey, we're fighting this on your behalf, but now we're moving on, and schools like Tennessee can rest assured nothing's going to happen. And, and still for Tennessee, it's not a big deal. I think they were already kind of yeah. business as usual, but it's good to know that the NCA is officially wrapping this up. They're not... It doesn't sound like there's going to be any notice of allegations coming forward for Tennessee. That's, that's all good news. It's, it's all kind of pending the court case now. It's just yeah. like basically they've called timeout until that court case comes through, and then they'll, if they win or lose that, but I don't see any, like Vince, I don't see any way they win yeah. that. So it's kind of dead. Josh, you agree with that or yeah, anything totally. else? I, I think even before Judge Corker's ruling a little more than a week ago, there was very minor concern. Um, I, so since then, I think that's probably gone away. With non-NIL related stuff, I'm sure it's also business as usual of compliance is following what's going on and making sure things are buttoned up. But again, with no concern level, sometimes you need things to turn in. I think it's more about what happens next, which we'll get to as well coming up. But I, in, in terms of what the discussion has been over the last several weeks, I don't think there's any concern. I think Tennessee people are going about their business. What have you heard, Ryan, on the recruiting front in terms of, all right, right now there are no NIL rules. So are just people just, is it spring break? Are people losing their minds? Is it Animal House out there in the recruiting world? I mean, or are people still, well, okay, let's, let's not be crazy about this. I, I think it's still been business as usual. I think the reality of this is. Well, business as usual, or is the, now, now there's, there's no speed limit. Yeah. So is it the Autobahn now and people are, you know, I mean, putting the foot down on their Ferrari? I mean, maybe. Now, now, one thing about this, they did, the NCAA did mention this statement that there still are a few rules you can't break. There's still, you know. <laughs> It's not just all right. NIL is off. Until the next court case. It, it's just that basically they're saying that what Tennessee was accused mm -hmm. of doing, which was just collective involved uh, mm -hmm. allegations, that's, they're not going to look into that anymore. So collectives now are free to do what they want. So in that sense, that opens the door for things. It doesn't. It's, coaches still have to keep their hands right. clean of this. There's still some rules. But, yeah, collectives are free to do what they want. So there might be some collectives out there elsewhere that are feeling a little more emboldened to do what they wanted to do before. For most collectives, I think they already kind of were. I don't think much has changed, honestly. Spire said it pretty emboldened from the beginning, so <laughs> I don't know that they could get more emboldened, but other groups out there may. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just wondered if it was like, woo no rules, let's have at it. All right, good deal. Uh, when we come back, the format for a proposed 14-team football playoff has leaked, and it's a boost for two conferences. Not everyone. Is that fair? Should a playoff format be fair? We'll discuss. Come on back on the Sports Source. <laughs> Welcome back in to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Daniel Hood Roofing. Are your shingles older than they should be? The extremes in weather in East Tennessee do damage to the waterproofing material on shingles. High heat, bitter cold, more rain than Seattle, which we actually get. It, it all takes its toll. Don't wait till you see a stain on your ceiling. That means there's already damage up there in your attic and on your roof. Get a free roof inspection this week. Call Daniel Hood Roofing, dot, or call Daniel Hood Roofing or visit DanielHoodRoofing.com. Calling DanielHoodRoofing.com won't do you much good. Either visit that or call them. All right. Uh, so in two weeks, we've gone from a 12-team playoff to rumors of a 14-team playoff to now we've got a format for the 14-team playoff. Uh, leaked this week, and what we learned about it tells you exactly how the 14 teams, the most likely plan, how they would be chosen. 
three automatic bids would go to the SEC, three automatic bids would go to the Big Ten, two automatic bids would go to the Big 12, two to the ACC, you'd have one automatic bid to the highest ranked group of five team, and then you'd, you'd go from having five at-large bids in the 12 team, or actually, is that right? No, you'd go, uh, you'd have seven at-large bids in the yeah, 12 team. five and seven, yeah. Yeah, to only three at-large in this 14 team playoff. Uh, interesting take here. My question, if you're the Big 12 in the ACC, do you, their coaches are losing their minds because the other part of this format, let's come on back to me here. See, that's how the 14 yeah. teams are chosen. But the other part that's making a lot of coaches upset, there would be two guaranteed buys. It wouldn't be the top two ranked teams. It would be the SEC champion and the Big Ten champion. Didn't matter if they're ranked sixth <laughs> and eighth. They get the buys. If somebody else is 14-0 and and won their league, you can only be seeded right. third. That's best, and you don't get a buy. So the question is, and I'll start with you, Chuck, is, is this a fair format, first of all? No. Second, <laughs> okay. We all agree it's simple. Yeah. It's not a fair yeah. format. Yeah. Should it be? It could probably be more fair than that in what they've said. I mean, the, the getting the first-round buys, to me, I think that's just something you float out there, maybe not even really fully expecting to get it. But if you do, so be it. But uh, – it can be more fair than what that is. Okay, can be, but should it be? Yes. Yes, yes. it should be. Okay. Yes. You know, yes. part of me says, yes, it should be more fair. But then if you look at the SEC, more so, I think, than the Big Ten, the third team in the SEC over the past few years has been a really good team. Now, the automatic buy thing for the SEC and the Big Ten champions, no, I don't like that either. So, I, I think the – <laughs> guaranteeing three teams, okay, I kind of I kind of like that. I kind of agree with that. I don't think the automatic buys for the champions yeah, it's, ought to be there. Especially yeah. with expansion, right, with the teams you're adding. I can see how, yeah. What, what yeah, I, I, I yeah. mean, right oh, now. I see why I see they're that. saying it. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that part, but the automatic buy thing, that's where I yeah. struggle with it. Well, it's clearly a, hey, we're, we have a status in college football, yeah, and it's a tier system, and that's what they are executing. And what's even more wild is that is a compromise for the SEC and the Big Ten. They actually wanted four, not three. So they feel like, hey, we're, we're giving something back to the rest <laughs> of you yeah. and settling for three automatics. Yeah. If, you're, if you're so great, and both of them are, you're going to fill those spots and more. So I don't, I, I don't agree with the guarantee of a certain amount of spots and that buy. Yeah, my, one thing you should look at that when you see that graphic that I put up there earlier and you're looking at it, automatic birth, automatic birth. Don't look at it that way. I should have written it another way. It's automatic cash. That's what they're looking <laughs> yeah. for. They want guaranteed. Yeah. Given, they don't care who gets in. And you can sit there and say, oh, no, the SEC will to Alabama. I don't, they don't care. They don't care if it's, if it's Kentucky, Vandy, and Mississippi State that gets in there. That's still money, money, money. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a money grab. And here's where I can – I bet I can shift your thinking on that automatic for basic – I'm not going to admit it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say the NFC South becomes really, really strong. And they say, we're going to start giving more automatic playoff berths in the NFC to the NFC South. And the NFC North, you're only going to get one team in. So the Vikings have to fight for that one place, whereas the Bucks or the Falcons yeah. would have three shots uh, in. Would that change your thinking? It it would change my thinking to an extent, but the I N the, <laughs> the, the the NFL is more of a even Steven across Correct. the board. Yes. This team in in college football, you just don't have that. You have what 134 Division one teams, whatever the number is. Yeah. On a given minute, you've yeah, got that many. About and, 70 and, and, or, or and power And the difference, the difference as you go from up here to down there is so great that even the even an NFL expansion team, you don't have the gap between the best and, and where you would be. So I just, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, my thinking could be changed on that. But right now, I just think that gap is going to get even bigger going forward. Well, I think it needs to, if you want it to be long lasting, I think you need it to be fair. Name me another NCAA tournament playoff system that is weighted in favor of certain conferences. 
there aren't any. It's no. never happened. No. So I think if it's not fair, you're going to have people that pull away from it. That said, I don't think there's a long-term solution anyway because I think this whole thing is going to blow up. Right. And it's yes. probably going to wind up with the SEC adding, this is another reason for Florida State and Clemson, to yes. say, get me out of here and get me into the SEC. I, I was actually saving that for later. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. And, and it's also a look power move, like the SEC and Big Ten saying we're the bully on the block, right? Sure. And look at the past history of the BCS uh, playoffs and who wins them, who gets to the championship games. That's why we deserve this, even when it was just limited to four teams. Yeah. Just, we're the ones that are, we're the big dog. I just you know? wonder at what point is it enough? I, this reminds me, and I'm going off the topic for a second. Uh, if anybody had seen, there was a, a, a documentary done on the Eagles, the rock band. And they kicked out one of the Randy Meisner or somebody yeah. who was one of their key members. They kicked him out when they all got back together. They threw him out because he kept asking for more money. He wanted it to be an even split of the cash. And Don Henley and Glenn Fry said, we're the ones that had all the solo hits. We, we are the draw. And I remember Glenn Fry saying, why couldn't he just, why is that much money we were making? Why wasn't that enough for Randy? And I'm sitting there thinking, you had more money than him. Why wasn't it enough for you? <laughs> and I kind of think the SEC and Big Ten are the Don Henley and the Glenn Fry in this. Well, we deserve more, and we're going to get more, and we're going to take more, and I don't know that that's going to – I don't know if that's good for college sports, but I tell you what, we'll talk about that when we come back. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Safety Systems, East Tennessee's most trusted name in security systems. For your home or your business, VFL J.J. Serlis and his team have protected people's property all over East Tennessee for more than 20 years. And if you think you don't need a security system, I've said this before, do what I do and get hooked watching those YouTube things of most awful thing ever caught on a doorbell cam. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be buying hand grenades to protect yourself. Uh, security systems, always helpful. Safety systems can do one for you or your business. All right, uh, back with, well, let me remind people of the poll again. Continue to vote there. It looks like the retire the jersey is taking off, 81%, as if I can read it from here. Um, so that's the winner. Come on now. There's got to be some bad people out there. <laughs> Pancrads isn't the only evil guy in town. We need more people voting the other way. All right, right now it looks like Tony White needs to have that jersey retired. Uh, back with Ryan Callahan, Bob, Chuck. Is this whole thing good for Tennessee? I mean, you would think, okay, you're going from 12 teams getting in to 14 teams getting in. That's got to be better for Tennessee. But as we've just shown, if you're going from a 12-team setup with seven at-large bids and an SEC champion versus three SEC, top three SEC teams, and then only three at-large teams, it seems like fewer opportunities for Tennessee. So do you feel better or worse about Tennessee's chances if this 14-team playoff actually got approved and went through? I think it's, it's no better than what uh, just a more open system with fewer automatic bids would be for Tennessee. I do think there's a good chance at least one of those three at larges is going to an SEC team. So it probably ends up being about a wash. But I think the SEC might be sacrificing on the possibility of getting four or five teams in some years just in the interest of getting that first round by. It seems like they set the bar high. They said, hey, we want four automatic bids and all this stuff just so they could lower it and seem like they're being reasonable yeah. by giving themselves only three in exchange for that first round buy. I think they really want that first round buy. And that's, I don't love that. Again, I don't, I don't think that's fair. Some years, I mean, look at what happened this year. Georgia, Alabama, like neither of those teams would have been really warranting a first round buy on a 14 team field, but they would have gotten it in this format. So I, I don't love that, but I think that's what the SEC really wants. And as a result, the system that they're kind of proposing is really no better for teams that want to want a path to the playoff. If you took last year's final rankings and applied them to this format moving forward, Michigan would get in at number one with a bye. Number two was Washington uh, from the Big Ten now. They'd be in the Big Ten. They wouldn't, get a, yeah. they wouldn't get a bye because they're Big Ten. Texas would have been the SEC champ if you went by ratings. They would get the bye. So one and three would get the bye. Uh, Alabama would get in. Florida State would be an ACC team. Georgia would get in. Ohio State would get in. Then the 14th ranked team, you, you, you drop down, uh, the next automatic team would be Arizona, who was 14th. They'd be the Big 12 top team. Louisville would get in at 15 for the ACC second slot. <laughs> Oklahoma State, number 20, would get in as the Big 12 second slot. Liberty at 23 would get in as the group of five team. And then your at-large teams would be eight Oregon, nine Missouri, 10 Penn State. So you'd be adding Louisville from the ACC, Oklahoma State from the Big 12, Liberty from the group of five. You'd be kicking out 
Ole Miss, SEC at 11, Oklahoma, SEC at 12, wow. LSU, SEC at 13. That's just from last year. So I don't know that that makes me feel any better about – if I'm Tennessee, I think I prefer the – if I'm looking to win a championship and get into the playoff, I'd want the 12. If I don't care who gets in and I just want my share of the SEC's revenue, I guess 14 is better with a guaranteed buy. But I would want the – I would want the 12 team. Seems like a better path to title if I'm Tennessee. I think the 12 team is better for Tennessee. But here's the thing I keep coming back to. You've got Georgia on your schedule every year. You've got Alabama on your schedule every year. There's well, been we may two. or may not moving well, forward. Well, it kind of looks like. If you lose one game, the, the previous thing, you're pretty much on a winner. You're, if you lose another game, you're out. With the 12 team, you still have, I think you had better chances. With this, there's going to be more people, I think, crying foul on who gets in as opposed to who gets left out. Oh, I think if Tennessee's ranked number 11, like Ole Miss would have been in this situation, right. mm-hmm. and then they watch number 20 Oklahoma State get in from the Big 12 exactly. because it's automatic, I think that would make them mad. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to have to look at this a lot longer before I can settle in on it because if, you, if you're if you a 10-2 Tennessee, and let's say Georgia and Alabama is your, your hang-up most years, if that's where you come in in most years, does that get you number three in the SEC? Uh, I mean, close. that is yeah. that is the you question. Ten You're going to be right, right there, there if Georgia and Alabama continue to be as dominant as they are. In a 16-team so, SEC, yeah. Well, you know, I, really... I think you're going to have to be 10-2 and two with yep. no more than two SEC losses anyway. Yep. Well, here's the thing. Last year, Missouri would not have gotten into this thing. Yep. Last year, it would have been three SEC teams only. It would have been Texas, Alabama, Georgia. And this, uh, <laughs> and you, well, I, you know, and, and it'll be interesting when Texas comes in. I mean, yeah, right. you know, would that would that have exactly. stayed? I mean, now you're getting into the hypothetical. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. I'm just talking thing. about yeah. these are just Team X, Team Y. Right. Or, yeah. and, and you asked earlier, is it fair? Of course it's not fair. But the, the what I hate is the, the, the motivations, clearly, in all this are power and money. Right. right. It's all about the SEC and Big Ten have been coalescing all this power and money. So now they're, what they're wanting to do is this first round buy they're wanting is to protect the championship games. They want the SEC championship game to mean something so that it's still a big draw. So they yeah. want money for the championship game. Mm-hmm. They want money for playoff teams. This is their best way of getting both. That shouldn't be what determines the field for a national championship playoff in theory, but that's all they care about. I'm shocked that the SEC continues to say we are locked in with Atlanta. Atlanta is the home of our SEC title game, and it will be. At some point, they are such money-grubbing weasels. Yeah. I think they're going to say, wait a second, we could bid this thing out and make tons more money every yeah. year. Have it in New Orleans. Exactly. Or have, well, it, have, have it in Dallas. Have, have it, in, have it Dallas. in the new place in Nashville. Yeah. Have, I mean, right. they're going to figure this out at some point. That we're just going to, The way they, they're trying to lock in, which is the opposite of yeah. everything. Every other move they're making right now is just, where's the most money? Let's go there. But they're locking in Nashville with basketball they're, for the men's basketball tournament. They're locking in Atlanta with football. I suspect that will change at some point in the future because Agreed. they'll realize, oh, there's an extra dollar? Okay, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come play that thing in Greenback. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, when we come back, there are reports that the SEC and Big Ten presidents and chancellors are already talking about leaving the NCAA. Bombshell buried in a small ESPN story. Let's discuss that next. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Games and Things. We're just a week away from the conference tournaments, folks. Then the NCAA tournament, then baseball, Masters, NASCAR. It's time for your sports viewing to take a big jump up. And the way to do that, get to Games and Things, get yourself some home theater seats. Comfortable home theater seats. Nobody has a bigger selection. Nobody has a better selection. Nobody has better pricing. OurGameRoom.com to learn more or get down to the corner of Kingston Pike and Lovell Road and see for yourself. Scott and Lisa Mellon do a great job. Games and things because life should be fun. All right, here's something else that should be. Tennessee should retire Tony White's jersey. According to you, uh, you voted on it. 4% say he's not good enough. They watched him or uh, maybe they didn't watch him. I think they didn't watch him if they didn't get enough. Uh, 13% agree with Mark. Look, you've got criteria, live by the criteria. I understand that. And then 83% retire it already because sometimes not everybody, not everybody fits into a square box. Yeah. All right. So I, I'm with everybody. I'll put it this way. Uh, the sports source will go and fund the new banner. You just hang it. We'll buy the banner for you, UT. You just hang it. That's a promise. We'll raise the money. Prevent the, the, we'll, we'll provide the banner. You hang it. 
All right, now let's take a look at the uh, next little full screen we got here. This was buried in an NCA in an ESPN story, I should say. Josh Ward pointed this out. You do a weekly uh, mail out newsletter from your show with uh, Jason Swain. It's really good. People should go and sign up for this. Thank I you. would have missed this story. It was buried in the middle of the story. It was quoting, well, here it is. This is written by ESPN. One high-ranking official involved in the discussions about the playoff told ESPN on Wednesday that the presidents and chancellors in both the SEC and Big Ten are having conversations about whether to continue their NCAA membership. Those conversations are happening, the source said, adding some feel pretty strongly about pulling away. I'd say very strongly. Now let me couple that with something that came out in the Sentinel on Friday. Uh, the UT Board of Directors voted to uh, basically uh, create a nonprofit foundation that could quickly mobilize into a fund to pay salaries to athletes. The idea being that if the NCAA loses all these court cases and the players become employees, now Tennessee will be able to do it. I look at it in connection to this other story, and I'm thinking maybe the SEC has given all their schools a heads up that be looking at this, we're considering yanking out. We're all talking about getting out of here, so let's look at, let's be ready to pay our own players. Regardless, we don't care what the NCAA says, we're not going to be with them any longer. Here's my question. Let's say this happens. Let's say it just happens, and we don't know what the, the final breakdown is going to be. But, Josh, do you think fans will like it on the other side? Everybody hates the NCAA. I still don't think they understand that the schools are the NCAA. Mm -hmm. But do you think they're all going to be happy living in lollipop land with whatever comes next? When you no longer, when Florida State and you know, Oklahoma State are no longer in your division, they're somewhere else. You don't even play. When you've just got SEC and Big Ten rule the world, are fans going to like that, do you think? My guess is that a lot of people will not. It is very easy to just pile on the NCAA and criticize the NCAA, and I've had my own uh, yeah. list of critical items <laughs> for the NCAA. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the alternative option is easy. And this just brings up to me a bunch of questions. Okay, well, who's going to manage all that has to be managed? Who's going to be a part of all that the NCAA does that you don't see day to day? Football obviously rules. Football is what is going to ultimately decide this. But the NCAA manages all these other different sports. We're excited about the NCAA tournament, right? Yeah. The what tournament? The NCAA tournament. And then you get to the other sports that don't, aren't nearly as popular but have a lot of responsibility back to the NCAA to manage all that. Are the SEC, the Big Ten schools, and whoever else follows along, are they going to be ready to take on all of that responsibility that will come if they're breaking away from the NCAA and somebody else is in charge? Yeah, and it also doesn't specify, does this mean they're pulling away in every sport? Or does this just mean football, which a lot of people think? We've got about 30 seconds for everybody here. Everybody can take their 30 seconds. Vince, your thoughts on what this means, that they're already talking about pulling out. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing where sports are headed? I think fans will do what they've done with all the other changes we've had. They won't like it, they'll complain about it, and they'll watch. And they'll spend their money. And I, I think that's, it, you know, it, it only incentivizes them to be able to do what they want. Not that that would be the ultimate thing, but I, I, I do think people will ultimately adjust and just not be super happy with it because it's so, going to be so different. I think, I think the initial reaction, a lot of SEC and Big Ten fans will think it's great, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think the end result will be that they won't really like the way it looks because one of the things is fairness. The NCAA gives you this sort of veil of thinking things are fair. What mm -hmm. about when the SEC and the Big Ten are essentially ruling college football and you've got to decide who gets into a playoff, who gets into the NCAA tournament, all that stuff? or whatever the NCAA tournament would be at that point. I mean, mm -hmm. you have a lot of things that come down to fairness, and if there's a, a pie of the, uh, you know, the, the pie yeah. is being broken down where more money's going to the SEC and the Big Ten, how are fans of any conference going to think things are fair? I just wonder how the SEC and Big Ten, uh, do they, do they leave, leave on their own and then do their own rule books? Right. Because I don't see them. Those are two wildly different conferences. Yes. I don't know if they have the same rule book. And if you create a system to where four years in a row the Big Ten makes more money yeah. somehow, Okay, now the SEC's mad. If you're along right now, which is great. Yeah. Previously, they have not. What if they don't again? Bob, 30 seconds to end this up. Is this a good thing where this is going or no? No, it's not a good thing <laughs> where it's going because I think eventually nobody pays big dollars to watch minor league sports. And that's what you're going to get with football. It's going to be a minor league to the NFL. I mean, do you go to Major League Baseball or AAA or, or AA? And I think that's where it's going. And I think you'll lose some people out of it because I think it'll be devalued because you're becoming a minor 
Pro League? I go to double A games because it's right downtown in Knoxville. Yeah. Coming soon. All right. Uh, when we come back, what's the line for Tennessee versus South Carolina? Chuck's going to set that. We'll tell you who's going to win. Plus, how you feel about $85 million going into the Food City Center? More money, more of that money. They're spending that money. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Pipe Wrench Heating, Cooling, Plumbing, and Drain Cleaning. When you run into an issue in your home, it's a good bet that Pipe Ridge could fix it for you. And if they don't make it on the day you call, their visit is free. I've called these folks before for a kitchen emergency. They came out exactly when they said they would. They did a great job. I was very happy. PipeRinch.com to learn more. There's a reason these folks are always voted number one in East Tennessee in every poll you see for any of these plumbing, heating, cooling needs and drain cleaning. PipeRinch.com. Okay, we got about three and a half, four minutes here. Chuck Cavalleras, you're over there with your board. Tell us what the line is going to be for Tennessee at South Carolina on Wednesday night. I kind of agree with what Mark Pankrak said. I think this is going to be one of the tougher games between Tennessee and Kentucky. I think this is tougher. I got Tennessee minus five and a half, John. Okay, you've raised it since we talked last yes, night. You've jumped it quite a bit. You've, you've bumped at a field goal. A three-pointer, yeah, by connect. Okay. <laughs> All right, very good. All right, he's got Tennessee by five and a half on the road at South Carolina. Vince Ferrara. Who are you taking? I would go Tennessee. I would give those points uh, slightly. Yeah. Okay. Man. Five and a half is tough. Yeah. On the road. I went in thinking I was going to pick Tennessee. I'll take South Carolina to cover. I think, I think Tennessee wins this game, but I, I think it's a close one. I, I'm, with, I'm with Mark. I still think they're going to drop one of these last four. And to be honest with you, I'd kind of like for them to drop one. I don't, I don't like going into the tournament with some long streak trailing behind me. So uh, I, I'm going to take South Carolina. Uh, I'll take South Carolina – Plus the points. I mean, they played so well in Knoxville. Uh, Tennessee has the revenge factor title and all that stuff. But I'll say South Carolina to cover Tennessee to win. Bob? I'm going to go with what Josh has. I'm, I'll take South Carolina to cover, but Tennessee wins a close one. Okay. And Tennessee's six-game winning streak is the longest in the SEC. What South Carolina's do? won three. What would you do with your I'm still line? riding with Tennessee. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, it was announced uh, yesterday. Well, it looks like it's in the it's in the works. It's not completely approved yet. I think they still need the state legislature to sign off on it. But eighty five million in renovations for Thompson Bowling Arena, Food City Center, whatever you want to call it. Uh, twenty million of that. You know, Food City is paying twenty million a year for ten years, or twenty million total for ten years of naming rights. Apparently, um, so part of that comes from what they're paying. Uh, it's going to be fan experience upgrades, new club seat amenities, or new club amenities, updates to the Ray Mears room, a new center-hung media, a new center-hung scoreboard, and a new modernized exterior. To me, that's the one you need because it's a weird-looking building. Uh, your thoughts on? You've now got 350 million into Nealon Stadium. You've got whatever million into Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Another 80 million between friends going to uh, Thompson Bowling Food City Center. Uh, Rusty Wayne, Rusty no. Wallace, Kia. <laughs> they want to stick on the next. Uh, about a minute here. Does it need? Is that just the cost of doing business? You just continually upgrade because I don't know that Thompson Bowling Arena really needs that much of that. Well, like everything Danny White does, it's about maximizing revenue. He's spending money to make money. Yep. He's got. He sees a lot of wasted space under the seats at, at Thompson Bowling Arena. He's. He's. He wants that center hung scoreboard, but those club amenities. That's a big thing. They're going to make more money off that. So, I, I think people are going to like the end result because it's going to be more revenue for Tennessee. Vince, you like it? Thumbs up? Thumbs yeah, down, uh, thumbs up. I think it's needed, and then uh, certainly the exterior is a part of that equation. Yep. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, I guess. I can't keep up with college sports spending anymore. You could have said it's going to cost $850 million. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Bob, thumbs up, thumbs down? I, I guess thumbs sideways. <laughs> I, I think I went to, I haven't been, money. I haven't been this year, but it's a good thing. Thumbs up, but the price will go up, I okay. guarantee you. Yeah, that's true. All right. <laughs> thanks to all these guys. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to you. Appreciate you being back with us this week. And uh, we will see you next week right back here on Sunday to talk about, hopefully, Tennessee's SEC, t SEC title. It will be next Sunday. See you then. <laughs>